guys. It's good to be with you today. And to welcome to those of you guys watching online. Now, today we are beginning a new three-part series, right? Nobody stands alone. And I want to take the angle today that there is power in belonging. So that's what we're going to talk about. But before we get there, I always like to acknowledge the Holy Spirit here and to invite him to come even more intensely. So if you bow your heads with me, I'm going to do just that. Yes, Father. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would just make yourself known, Lord, that you would come through every nook and cranny in this room, Lord. We just take, yeah, I see that. I take spiritual authority of what's going on in this room, and I align it under your purpose, God. And I ask that you would go through these airways also, <clears throat> and so that those that are watching online, Lord, could also feel your presence. Father God, I can talk a thousand words, and yet one touch from, from you makes all the difference in the world. And so, Holy Spirit, come, be with us. Take these ordinary words and do your extraordinary purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You know, I am talking about, you know, people not being able to stand alone, but that's almost counterculture, isn't it? Because our whole American system is based on independence, right? Self-reliance, pull yourself up by the bootstraps. But, you know, if you go back and you look in history... Any great event or a person, for that matter, that did something that was of great notoriety, you'll see that they were never standing alone, that they always had a group of people that were around them that helped them to achieve that. And so really, there is this power or synergy that goes before us when we belong, when we're a part of something, right? Now, it is August. It's hot here, <laughs> right? Very hot. But I am in great anticipation because... I know September is the beginning of football season, right? And I love football. In our home, we watch it at nauseum. I grew up in it with my dad. And so it's something that I enjoy immensely. And I'll tell you the truth, whether you are a Patriots fan or not, you love them or you hate them, right? You can't deny that the head coach, Bill Pelichuk, that he is an efficient coach. When you look at his stats, they're pretty impressive, right? And so this is what he looks like for those of you that don't, you know, don't know him. But anyway, when we look at his stats, right, I really got to, to uh, engage in those when I started playing fantasy football. Because like I said, this isn't my team, right? But I knew I always wanted him as my coach on my fantasy football team because he gave me a lot of points, right, and a lot of his players. And so I, was, uh, I found out a lot about him. Like, he's won 17 uh, division titles, right? And, and not only that, he's gone to the Super Bowl nine times in his career, right? Three of them he won with the New England, New England Patriots, right? And then the other two was under Parcells' head coach uh, direction when he was working with the Giants, right? He was their defensive coordinator. So we see this guy really making waves and, and helping to contribute to making champion teams. So I figured... Football season, we can look at him a little bit, right? I mean, he's actually, the way he is so successful, I think, personally, I think that in, it's going to go down in NFL history as he's going to be one of the greatest coaches that ever was, right? But, yeah, they'll go, no, he's a cheater. No, I mean, I'm honestly, honestly, I do. I think that right behind, you know, uh, was it, you know, Don Shuler, right behind him, right? So we really can look at how... Uh, Bill Belichick is running the teams to see some things that we can find to be a truism for us. And here you go. I, when I was looking at him, what I saw is that he sees teams not as a conglomerate of these, you know, highly gifted men, but he sees them as his job is to put them in as a unit and make them work together. And he does that in three ways, and I want to show you that today because I think we can learn from him. Three keys to developing a winning team. First one, he inspires this heroic off-the-field commitment, you know? So his players, they're just not committed just to come and to do what the, they ask of them. No, no, no. They're off the field doing all kinds of stuff, like the training, right? They don't just train in season, uh, but they also train off-season. And you can see them, you know, trying to increase their, their uh, flexibility, their mobility, things like that. And not just in physical stuff. They're watching films all throughout the year, right? And so they're trying to learn. It's almost like they enthusiastically enter into this another level, 
right? This 24 7 uh, concept is I want to win, I want to be on this team. And so they give it their all. And it's nothing less than heroic. And I also note that they have what I call effective team meetings. You see, Bilichek, he knows, he knows the importance of this meeting. He takes every meeting and he never loses an opportunity to tell them the vision, right? He casts the vision of what they're doing, but he doesn't just cast the vision. He tells them the goals they're going to achieve there. And then he does a performance review, right? And so, like, these meetings are high, they're intense, right? And he knows that he wants to make sure he keeps this before the people. He's even been known to, to write notes and to, to slap it on the doors of the practice field for when the guys are coming in and they read it, right? And so he's got these uh, spiffy sayings, and one of them is, you know, um, uh, close out all the noise, right? Shut down the noise. And see, so one of the things he was communicating with that is he knew, Belichick knew, that there could only be one voice. There could only be one message, and there could only be one vision. And he knew he had to fight for those guys to keep that in front of them so they would stay on track, right? So he never missed an opportunity to communicate openly and honestly with his team in these meetings. And also, he was the art, he had the art of practicing in smaller units. He would get all his players together and give them these big concepts and what it's going to take. And, you know, they would watch different films and things like that, right? But then he would pull back and he would break them up into units. Like you have the defensive unit, you know, the offensive and the defensive and the specialty teams. He'd break them all up and then he'd set them out on the field with the head knowledge they had to practice their skills. And they practice them and practice them so they would become perfect in what they did. And then he would bring them back to the bigger unit and they would practice together, right? So what I see with Belichick, guys, is he had this strategy at which he led right? This strategy of empowering his people to be able to see the importance of, of what they were doing and connect that into the whole. Well, I got to thinking, that's kind of like our Jesus. That's kind of like Jesus Christ. He said to you and I, he said this, he said, I will build my church, this is what Jesus said, and the gates of hell, that's all the resistance, the gates of hell will not overpower it, Right? that the gates of hell will not overpower it. In other words, it won't re you know, push it down and make it not existent. You see, I see Jesus, he looks at the church, and this can just get me so fired up because I believe with all my heart and every fiber of my being that Jesus looks at our church and all local churches, and he says, hey, you are supposed to be champion teams. I think he looks and he has a dream that, that the churches would rise up and proclaim the love of the Father openly and boldly. That he would, that, you know, our church and other churches would be able to inspire their people enough to, to know that spiritual development is something they should exhibit and they should be on fire for it and be enthusiastic about it. And I believe that, that the church is supposed to rise up you're supposed to understand how God has shaped you, the gifts he's given you. Why? So that you can understand your purpose in life. Why? So you can make a difference. You see, I believe that Jesus is wanting that of us. He's wanting that of the church. Now, how can this come about? <laughs> you know, how can it come about? Well, first, you have to see the church like I do. The church is not the four walls. It never has been. It's never about a piece of real estate. It's about the hearts and the minds of those of you that are sitting here, those of you that are watching. This is your church home. It's about you. It's about your heart understanding how to become fully devoted followers of Christ and understanding the potential which God has put inside of you, right? And so that's what God is after here. And so when we look at it and we go, yeah, but what's the practical fallout of this? How do we exactly supposed to achieve being the champion team, the church that prevails, the strong church? Well, back to football, right? I think what, what Belichick learned and I learned watching him, I think we as a church can learn from this. And so I'm going to suggest that the church is a prevailing church when? Individuals commit to off-site spiritual development. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Off-site spiritual development. That means not just in here. 
right? Not just coming to church, but that you take it onto yourself and you decide, I'm going to be committed outside of the weekend service to grow myself spiritually, right? To grow myself spiritually and you're heading in that direction. And 1 Timothy, it talks about it. It says bodily exercise is all right. It's okay, that's good. But watch this, what's more important? But spiritual exercise is much more important and it is a tonic, which is like a medicine, right? A, tomi- t- a tonic for all who do it. And exercise yourself spiritually and practice being a better Christian because that will help you not only now, I love this, it not only helps you now in your life, but in the life to come, right? So again, there's a vision here that we need to grab hold of, that we need to understand that God wants us to grow our spirits, right? He wants us spiritually for us to become disciplined. You know, I teach Grow Track 3, right? And in there, I talk to people about the importance of being part of this dream team. I talk about it being built on on these four foundational ideas, right? That all ministry is flowing from these four. And they are to love God, to love people, to pursue excellence. It means do your very best, right? And to choose joy, And I I talk about the practical application of those. You see, it's not just for the dream team. It's for us to get inside of us so that we can go out, right, and carry it into our families and our work and our friendships and whatever endeavor that we're doing. Now, guys, this this is so, uh, so important, right? So important for us to grab hold of that it is our responsibility to grow. Now, I have people come up to me often And it doesn't take long when you're around me. Things start to happen in the supernatural realm. They just do. And so I've I've had people ask me, like, how did you grow so close to the Lord? I'm going to tell you, it's not because somebody slapped a title of pastor on me. Not at all. You see, I grew close to my father in the quiet time, in the quiet hour. I'm not a morning person, but I get up before the sun does every day. Why? Because it's there that nobody wants anything of me, right? It's there that, that no, none of my responsibilities kick in, and it's there that I can sit and start talking to the Lord. You see, I have a place, a regular place, that I myself go and I sit. And I have my Bible, and I have my journal. I have my glasses, right, and my pen. And it's there that, that I sit and I start to engage. I turn my worship music on, and, and I engage and ask the Holy Spirit to come and to help me, to help me understand. And he speaks to me. He, you know, he takes me through the word of God. And it, it's different, right? But I usually go into a book and I'll stay there. And I'll read chapter by chapter. But it's sometimes not even a chapter. Sometimes I can't even get through one verse. Because God is just downloading all kinds of things, right? And I learn tremendous amounts when I'm there. But it's not even what I learn. I tell you, it's not a check off. It's a place that I feel so loved. I feel so accepted. I know who I am. I can tackle the world when I spend time with my father. He does that. He comes and he empowers us at this deep gut level. Guys, you benefit from that because I can bring my very best. And when I'm with people and they say, you know, they say they were just teasing me in the dream team party we had for our volunteers where they were saying, Pastor Sharon, when she looks at you, she sees your soul. That is not true, (laughs) right? (laughs) They were having fun at my expense. But let me tell you, let me tell you what they do know. They do know that I have this uncanny knack to call out what the Holy Spirit wants me to say. And in that, it speaks truth to people, okay? Just as if I were peering into their life, right? Now, how did that happen? Well, I have a three-way conversation. I do it every morning, right? And so that conversation, even now with you, I hear what my father says. I tell you what he says, and I move as he says. And so what I want you to do, because I'm nothing special, and believe me, I am not that smart, but I know my father, who is so capable, and he loves you. You're important to him. And if you will give him a chance just to go before him, he would be able to show you these things. He would be able to call out inside of you the greatness that he has placed inside of you. So my question is, what does your spiritual development look like? Do you have time for reading? Do you get up extra early? Do you, do you uh, take time to, to stop and try to develop? What does the voice of God sound like? Do you take that, that, that courageous step 
and then take what you're learning and enact it with people around you. You see, this is spiritual development. It's on our own. We, we do that with the Father, right? Guys, you want to know what a championship uh, church looks like, right? A strong, vibrant church. You look no further than your own spiritual development because you are the backbone. You are it. And so as much as you will pour into that, you will become strong. And as you become strong, we become strong. Do you see that? Okay, so first thing we learn is that we have to be able to, to individually commit to off-site spiritual development. Second team, the second thing is this team meetings and group meetings are, the operative word here is highly valued. Highly valued, right? In the time when Belichick calls his meeting, it's unthinkable that people wouldn't be there because they understood that they were going towards something great, right? Greater than themselves, and they were needed in those meetings. And so they made those meetings every time, right? And they were enthusiastic, and they got here. So what is our team meeting? What is our team meeting look like? It looks like right now, okay? It looks like right now. It's what we do on the weekend service, you see, this, this meeting we're having right now, it's for, it's for to teach, yes, yes, it teaches, but more importantly, it envisions you. It envisions you, it, you can hear the Lord, he talks to us about, about where we need to go, he, he challenges us, right? All that comes out in the weekend services when, when the teacher is, is, uh, is bringing you the word, hey, guys, it's a rally call. You see, God is about making a revolution happen, and he uses the local church because the local of the church is the hope of the world. And so Father is about using us this way, and so we need to get that in our mind, right? We need to get it in our mind. And Satan doesn't want us to meet together, I can tell you that much. Let us think about each other and help each other to show love and do good deeds, right? Now watch this. The fathers that wrote this, they understood us. You should not stay away from church meetings. Wow. You mean the Olympics is not more important? <laughs> you know? No, it's not. You should not stay away from church meetings, as some are doing. But you should meet together and encourage each other, right? Because this is a synergy here. Do this even more as you see, watch this the day coming. And so the call here is that, yes, it, yes, we, we come here and we learn, we get a vision, we're going in passion, but why? Because our call is so much more important than the Super Bowl ring. It has eternity on the line, right? And so we need to know that. We need to be able to walk out in that uh, faithfully, and we need to elevate the weekend status when we come together and we worship God, right? We need to come anticipating. You come in this auditorium. I do. I'm anticipating, God, what are you going to say today? God, this is, this is the third service. What are you going to say today, Lord? Right? And I come anticipating Father wants to move. Why do I know that from my gut? Because he loves you. And I know that he's called this church to be a champion church, to make a difference in the community. And so he will empower each and every one of us. We just need to, to make that commitment that we're coming to these meetings because we understand our rally call. I hear that. Our rally call is happening. Father just reminded me, guys, there can only be one voice. There, there can only be one message and one mission in life, and that is to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see that? And so God wants us to know that that's our rally cry when we meet together. This, this is an important concept if we want to be all that Christ wants us to be. The third thing is faith is exercised in small groups. This whole idea of the unit breakdown, right? That, that we can, there are things we can learn in private that I talked about. There are things that we learn uh, in, you know, that we can encounter in this bigger gathering, but there is something spiritually that you cannot participate unless you're in a small group of about 12 people, right? That's where it really comes alive here. And so it says in Ecclesiastes 4, two are better than one because together they can work more efficiently. Now watch this. If one of them falls down, the other can help him up. I know, I've done that, right? But if someone is alone and falls, this is sad. It's just too bad because there is no one there to help, 
right? No one there to help. And so we need to understand that God is wanting us to be in these groups where we can grow in our faith, that we grow in our faith and we're there to help one another. This is so important that I decided to take the time today to speak to people about joining a small group, all right? So for the rest of my message, we're going to talk about small groups. You know, people are all over the map. You have people like me. I'm not very uh, sophisticated or good at um, online stuff. And so I'm going to teach you from my gut level on this one. So I want to encourage you all this, this, um, this fall to be in a small group. You know what? That's been my prayer. Uh, that's been my prayer before the Father. And it seems so big and lofty, and I know it. But you have not because you believe not, right? You have not because you do not love well. And so that's what we're doing now. I'm loving on you, trying to get you into these small groups. So when you call up Vineyard Community Church or vineyardchurch.com, you go to this is the top, this is the page you see. And at that top element, you're going to see a couple of words. And I want you to click on the connect, come down to Vineyard Network, which is going to open up another page that looks just like this. And for those of you that want to join a group, you're going to hit right there where it says fall semester groups starting, right? And then once you get in, it's going to show you all the groups. It's going to give you the names of the groups, the days of the week, right? It's going to tell you whether it has child care. And so you can get a good good, uh, beat on it, right? And so this is not hard to go on and to do this process. And if you would just ask Holy Spirit to help you to do this, he will. He'll lead and guide you into the group that would, you know, that would be able to uh, allow you to exercise your faith. And that's what we're after here. And so I want to talk about uh, small groups because I want to keep encouraging you to do this. So here's just five things that I just pulled off at random because I think they make a huge difference. And I see them only being able to happen really in small groups. They can't happen by yourself and they don't happen in large groups, and here they are. First one is confession. You start with confession? (laughs) Yeah, I do. I do, because here's what I think. I think the human nature is so frail. I think we make many mistakes in life, right? And so I think we're constantly struggling here with with what I'm going to call sin, when we miss the mark, right? I see this in a a character in the Bible, uh, King David, right? King David, he was like this mighty, not just king, but a, a, a general, a battler, you know. He, he took his troops, he took the Israelites, and he was able to conquer lots of land and give their people back their space and stuff. And so he's this huge, bigger than life uh, character, right? But in the Bible, it tells us as David got older, he lost his way, right? And it says that one night he took out and he walked out, he was walking out and he saw a woman, and he desired her. He lusted after her. He wanted her. And so David maneuvered things so that this woman, her name is Bathsheba, that she was brought to him, and he had sex with her. And as a consequence of that, she became pregnant. Now David, he was like terrified because he knew that that meant death for her, right? He could hide with his power and authority, but he cared. And so he tried to cover up his sin. He tried to cover it up by doing all kinds of stuff, But nothing worked. So finally, he resorted to uh, taking her husband, Uriah, and putting him on the front lines of battle. And then behind the scenes, he told his, his generals to just pull back and let that squad be killed. And that indeed is what happened. That is the story. But what I want you to see here is I want you to see David's heart on the whole matter and how it affects him. And we see that you don't have it in your outline. You can just read it up here in Psalm 38. This is what David said. Because of my sin, my guilt has overwhelmed me. It's overwhelming me, right? It is a burden too heavy for me to bear. There are some of you, you are in some sinful stuff, and it is like a heavy burden, and it's too heavy for you to bear, right? And you're trying to find the answers like David. You're trying to make it happen yourself. And God just called the audible on whoever those people are right now. They are too heavy for you to bear. That's what God is even saying. Because of my sinful folly, I am crushed in spirit. Now watch this. And sadness, depression, sadness follows me wherever I go. 
And so in here, I identify with David. When I have found myself in a place where I have chosen unwisely and been foolish, it does. It's so hard because you can feel the weight of the sin, right? Now, here's the truth of the matter. We can ask God for forgiveness, and you know what? He forgives us totally. He throws our sin as far as the east is to the west, doesn't he? He does. He totally forgives us. But you know what? Sometimes it just keeps hanging on us. It's hard. And that is why the word also tells us that we need to confess one to another. We can need to confess one to another our sins, our shortcomings, where we've fallen. Well, why did God do that? Because he knows the human condition and he knows we need to see each other. He knows that, that he can forgive us, but we need to look at each other and own our crap. And then when we're doing that, right, that that looking back at you and that person being able to tell you, that trusted person you share that with, to tell you it's okay, God forgives you. God will forgive you. You can get up from this, right? You can let this go. You can put it in the hands of God. And then there's that hug. And I tell you, it puts flesh on the whole forgiveness process. And so God encourages us to confess to one another. He says this, Brothers and sisters, if someone in your group does something wrong, you who are spiritually strong, let's say you're strong, right? You should go to that person and gently make, make him right again. So what I want to pause here is because it is upon you and me to make a way for people to tell us where they've fallen, right? And not for gossip, but to help them to find freedom. So we provide that place for them to, to tell us what's going on. But then there's the caution. It says, but be careful because you might be tempted to sin, to be judgmental, right? To be too harsh or to be too forgiving when, the, when that's not your job either. And so, uh, you know, to, to say something's okay when it's not, let that person tell you, just let that person, let it soak. The Holy Spirit is what brings conviction, right? He brings that in. So you, you're not to be tempted. Uh, but helping each other with your troubles, you truly obey the law of Christ. You see, we are to love our brother, to love our sister. And that's what that says. And there is power, power in confession. So do I think that small groups, which offers this, is important? You betcha. You betcha I do. Second one is in small groups, we're going to uh, have life application of the word. We're going to have life application of the word. It's where we're going to not just hear the word, but we're going to actually do it. In small groups, this actually happens. And we get a caution here. It says in James, do not deceive yourselves by just listening to the word, like what I'm talking about now. Instead, put it into practice. So it takes it and we put it into practice. That's the call, right? Here's the ugly truth of this matter. 95% of what I share today will be forgotten by Wednesday. That's statistics, right? That's pretty sad. And if you're older like me, we forget by tomorrow. <laughs> I'm just saying, that's what happens. But when you go into a small group, they will bring the concepts. They bring the ideas back up to life. And then they take that one step further and said, you heard, but how are you going to change to line up with that? I love that. And so the application becomes more helpful in these small groups where you can talk. So today, if you find yourself, you know, in places of, of difficulty, not really understanding how to apply the Word of God, small groups. Small groups is that safe setting where you can do that, where they can, they can help you. Because I can tell you and talk to you about forgiveness, but if you ever try to walk it out, it's hard. Right? It's hard. And these folks will come alongside of you and help you with all the nuances of being able to walk that out. So this happens in small groups. So do I think small groups are important? Yeah, betcha. Yeah, betcha. All right, next one. In small groups, we get accountability. Accountability? What the heck is accountability? Well, that's where I let other people in on where I want to go, and I ask them to help me to to be my teammate, to go somewhere in this, in this journey with me, right? I'm accountable. I open myself up. If I want to grow my finances and I take a group, uh, you know, on, on uh, financial freedom, let's say Dave Ramsey, then when I go, I'm just not learning techniques. I'm working with the, you know, the leader to be able to look at my finances and help me and to call out when they see things that are wrong and I need to line up, right, to challenge me on how I'm spending money. Oof accountability. 
Accountability. Listen, I'm a child of the 60s, right? You know what that means? I hate to be told what to do. I have a rebellious spirit inside of me, right? Nobody puts baby in a box. That's, that's exactly my mantra, right? But you know, the older I have gotten, I realize when there are places that I am out of control, right, when I'm deviating from the Word of God, it's at that very time that I need to ask for help, that I need to make myself accountable to an outside source so that they can help me upright. That's what this is talking about. In small groups, we have that. And when this happen, it happens, this is what happens. People learn from one another, right? Just as iron sharpens iron, we become better at being able to handle it, better at being able to, to uh, take hold of our spiritual development and have people walk alongside us, cheering us on to become all that we can in Christ Jesus. I'm going to tell you, this does not happen privately, and it does not happen in a large group like this. It happens in a small little unit called a small group where there are people, maybe about 12, that can run with you. All right? So do I think small groups is important? You betcha. Okay. I'll get you before the end. You betcha. All right. Then also in small groups, we encounter spiritual growth. We are sensitive to God's guidance. When we become sensitive to God's guidance, what I'm talking about here is each and every one of us in our life, when you're doing journeys, right, you're walking along, you get to this place in life where you're standing and, and there's a crossroads. You can go left or you can go right. And, and many of us will stand and we scratch our head like, whoa, I wish I knew what God said. Yeah, I wish I knew what he wanted me to do. It could be your career. It could be your marriage. It could be, you know, something with your, your finances, right? But we find ourselves and we're scratching our head like, well, what am I going to do here? Right? And we so desperately want to discern God's guidance on this matter. Well, I'm going to tell you the way God works. Right? His best way of working is to use other people who are like-minded and who have the same value system that we have. Right? Who, who believe what we do. And so those are the best ones to run with and to be partners with. I see here in this scripture it says, plans fail without good advice which is so true when you're at that crossroads especially, but they succeed with the advice of many others. And so what we find here is when we are in a crossroads, if we've placed ourselves in a small group that's kind of like mixed types of people in there, I guarantee you that somebody in there is going through the exact same thing you did. I guarantee that, that they understand, and then they can provide for you not only a listening ear but a shoulder to cry on. Uh, right? And they can give you wisdom, wise counsel of, of things that they have done. And so you see, being able to discern God, he loves to use people. He uses us people for each other to help each other. And you can only find this in a small group. So again, do I think small groups is important? You betcha. You betcha. All right, last thing here is that small groups is going to produce uh, the expression of love. It expresses love, right? And so what exactly does that going to do? What does that look like? Love is about devotion. Love is about caring. Love is about loyalty, right? And so what we see here is that in 1 Peter, it says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received. You see, I'm 100% convinced that each and every one of you has gifts that God has placed inside of you. Now, these gifts he's placed inside of you are not for your own gain. It's not to make money. It's not to elevate yourself, but rather they are to serve others, to serve others. As faithful stewards of God's grace, it is in its various forms. And so we are to encourage one another, to help one another, right? That's what that is saying. And let me tell you, in the Vineyard Network, which is our small group network, how does that look? How does that love and loyalty and friendship, what does that look like? Well, the way we do, no matter what group you get into, they are committed to three things. The first one is to connect you. Is to connect you with what? With each other, right? So your leader is looking at you, and she or he wants to know all about you and wants you to know about them. They want to connect with you at the heart-to-heart -heart level. Not only do they want to connect to you, but they want to protect you. And so the group is set up that the number one thing we offer people in those groups is we pray for each other. We pray about our needs and our concerns, that we uphold each other before the Lord, 
who is the one that answers all our needs, right? And so they're also there to help you if you get in a time of need. So they protect you. So they want you to connect. They want you to protect. And the last thing is, they are the champion of your growth. They want you to become a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. And so to that end, they're going to work really hard to help you understand how do you take your next steps in growth. And so they're there for you. The protecting and the, and the connecting with you and the helping you grow, it's all a way of loving it, that loving you, right? And so, again, do I think that small groups is important? You betcha, I do, I do. And so I think it's part of what God has, has given to us as a blessing, right? And so I want to encourage each and every one of you to get activated to begin that. Now, when I started talking to you earlier, I started out with my football analogy. I lost those who hate football, but too bad. I like it. I'm teasing. Hey, listen, I believe, just like when I go to play fantasy football, man, I just, I just agonize over, you know, what, what I need to be doing, right? I agonize and I strategize and, and, and I do all this crazy research. That's why I know so much, right? Because I want to know how to pick the best team on my roster. I want my roster to have the best team. Why? Because I want to win the league, right? Listen, God in his love and his kindness has given Jesus the keys to the kingdom of God. And Jesus has put together a team and you are on his roster. You're on his roster. He chose you. He chose me. He chose you guys. And he sees in you all the greatness that he has deposited. But you know, he gives us choice. And so the way I look at it, to be on Team Jesus, right, it's going to take for us to step outside our comfort zone and to look at our lives and say, hmm, I wonder if I can grow in my spiritual development. What daily practice could I do that would help to expand that? Or, or to go, you know what, I'm not valuing that much the weekend service. I mean, it, maybe if I come three times or two times out of the month, that's pretty good. But to let the Holy Spirit radically shake you up and say, no, you're needed and you're wanted. And I want to talk to you during that event. Right? So you let him kind of radically challenge you there. And then there's the small groups. Guys. I talk about that at nauseam with people. Why? Because it's in relationship with one another that our faith really expands. And so you need to be there. Now, don't kid yourself. Today, God has been challenging us. This is a challenge that he has laid down before you, right? It's a challenge. He's saying, come all who have ears to hear what the Spirit of God is saying, that today is the day of salvation, that today is the day that you proclaim that, yes, I'm going to take these challenges, God, and with your help, I'm going to rise and become better at being this team member to be worthy of the roster which you put me on because I know that you want to use me you want to use me to be the hope of the world. You see, that's what's being asked of us. Bow your heads with me. I'm going to close in prayer. Holy Spirit, I thank you for being here. Yes. Settle your peace, Father, on your people. Yes. Breathe your peace all stillness in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, just go right now. Just go to the people. Settle on them, Father. Father is asking, the Spirit is, is bringing up, and he's saying, will you walk away from the culture who tells you what truth is? It lies. Will you walk away from it? You cannot hear my voice if you do not walk away. So Holy Spirit, I hear that. I hear that you have given us a mission to accomplish and that you are asking that of us. I hear that, Lord. Uh -huh. I also hear, Father, that you say, remember, remember, my children, remember that you were bought with the price 
and the price was the blood of my son, Jesus Christ. And so, Holy Spirit, I ask right now, even in the distraction, I ask right now that you would move upon the people, Lord, that they could hear you. Now, Father, I have felt that you challenged me in this. Normally, guys, I would just go in to pray for people that are far from God right now and, and call them home. But Spirit of God is on, side, is on me, and there's more. There's more to the ask today. There's more to the ask today. And online people, you are a part of the ask. Here it is, and don't miss it. He's saying, will you, pro will you publicly come? Yeah, I hear that. Publicly proclaim that you want uh, to win this challenge. These three things that were laid out, that you want to take that challenge and go forward. And so I'm going to ask you to do something that, that is very uncomfortable for most people. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand and to proclaim clearly and loudly with me some, uh, some of those challenges and your response to them. And so as you're getting ready, as you're praying, if God has called you to do that, those people that are in line, you're not left out. There's a little button that says, I accept Christ. If you just hit that, stand up right now. We know that you are part of what's going on here, right? Part of what's going on. So here's, here's what the Holy Spirit asked me to do. And I always do what my father tells me, even if I don't understand it, even though it's risk takey I'm going to ask that each person that has felt that, that call, right, that you felt those challenges, that you know that you struggle in those areas with the spiritual development or the value of weekend service attendance or even, or even getting into a small group, those are things you struggle with. Well, today, the Lord is asking you if you would like to proclaim that you want to be broken free from the old ways and find the new ways, then I'm going to invite you just to stand up right now, right where you're at, and we are going to uh, proclaim these things very loudly. So just stand right up if that's what you want. This is the challenge the Lord gives us. This is his challenge today for us. Yes, Father. This has nothing to, well, it does have something to do with salvation, but it's about being radically committed to being on God's team. So I'm going to give you another minute to think about this. Mm-hmm. Those of you that want, to want a new wind in your sails, right? You want to proclaim that this is a new day for you. I want you to repeat this after me, right where you're at, right? You can just say, uh, Father God, I accept the gift of salvation and the forgiveness of my sins. And I accept the mission to my community to be an extension of the good news of Christ and to help people find and fulfill that call in their life. And Holy Spirit, enter me now. Awaken me. Give me power to be a part of these small groups, Lord, to exercise my faith. Give me the power, God, to elevate the value of coming on a weekend service. On a weekend service. Yes. Yes, Lord. And Holy Spirit, help me to engage in daily activities that will grow my spirit. Now, Father, for those that were praying that prayer, I ask that you would seal it, Lord, in their hearts. I thank you, Father, that you want to do more than we can ever hope, dream, or imagine. That most of us, Father, will sit on the sidelines and watch, yet you have declared today that today is the day you come out of the grandstands and you come down and get suited up and that you play in your game. So Holy Spirit, 
I ask that you would just seal these promises that these folks made today. And I thank you for each and every one of them. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Now you guys can sit down. Mm -hmm. Okay, we are going to go into a, a bit of a transition here, right? But for those of you that... Yeah, that made this commitment for the first time. I'm looking for those that made a commitment for the first time. That you said, you know, I want to follow this Jesus. <laughs> I want to be on his team. Well, I'll tell you what. He loves you and he's just accepted you. But you got to tell somebody about it. So you can tell me about it by filling out uh, the little tab on the side of your program and putting it in the clear box when you leave. It, it's, uh, other people will be putting prayer requests and things like that in there. You can just drop it in. It'll come to us. And we'll help you with your next steps. For those of you online, the same thing is true. You are part of what's going on here. And so if you made that decision to follow Jesus, right, you have a next step. And so I want you to instant message us on whatever platform, and we will get back with you on your next step. Okay? It's important. Now, I know that life sometimes can come in and kick us pretty hard, right? We come in here, and we've been beaten up by the world. That is why we make sure that we have prayer people in the front always. Why? Because nobody's supposed to stand alone. We're here for each other. And so they will come up front, and I'll be up here, and I encourage you, do not leave without having somebody just stand in agreement with you. You're not by yourself. And there is power of belonging to one another. Okay? Now, those of you that call Vineyard Community Church your home, you call us your home, well, now we're going to continue uh, to worship, but we're also going to continue to worship God in our tithes and offerings. So there's going to come up on the screen different ways that you, you can, uh, you know, do that. And so, uh, yeah, that's for your information. Listen, though, those of you that do faithfully give, right, I'm, I'm not sure you realize that you provide the skeletal structure for this body called Vineyard. And when you are giving like that, you, you fill in the bones and then the meat we can put on top of it. You're so very valuable and so very loved. And I count it a blessing to be that part with you, okay? So I wanted to tell you that. And then uh, lastly, lastly, I'm going to have everybody stand back up because we are going into a song, right? We're going sing to uh, sing a song together. But uh, yes, Lord. So here you go. One more thing before you leave. God has asked me to do, and that is to seal, to seal stuff. So here I go. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would come and that you would seal every gift, every offering that has come, and that you would seal the words of those that had ears to hear what your Spirit was saying, that they would have new wind in their sails, they would begin to sail along in life, and a new cadence, a new power would flow through them. And I thank you, Lord, for their their love for you, in Jesus' name, amen.